Hi, I'm Leon Padel, and welcome to our show, Lake Views. The Great Lakes are the largest freshwater system in the world and an immeasurable natural asset. Our inland lakes and waterways feed into the Great Lakes, and their water quality is the first step in the water quality of this vast natural resource. Inland lakes and streams suffer a process called eutrophication which means too many nutrients get into the water. This causes the overgrowth of invasive and natural species, both plant and animal. This whole process is sped along by bad practices around our homes, particularly fertilization. Most importantly, eutrophication can disrupt delicate ecological balances. Welcome to Lake Views. Let me introduce my panel. To my far right is Doug Cooper, who is on a local association for a local lake. And to my right, Fred Newman, who works on a lake association with me. Uh, first, I wanted to start by talking about the chemistry of lakes. Um, as you two know, we're dealing with the input of nutrients. And it's really simple chemistry. We have so much water, we have phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, and we also have pollutants. And these things tend to stay in the water for long periods of time. We're going to show you a picture of eutrophication. And the eutrophication comes from the constant input as well as maintenance of these nutrient levels. Uh, the normal lake has very few weeds in it. It supports a great fish population. A eutrophic lake is a lake that's changing with ever-increasing growth of uh, weeds. And these weeds can be both native and invasives. Uh, the causes of this are very interesting, and I'll have you two comment in a minute. When a lake is pristine, there's really nothing there but absorbent soil, trees and plants that absorb the nutrients from the ground before the water washes into the lake. There's a certain number of animals on the lake, but it's not excessive, and it's really not a problem in terms of causing pollution. However, as our local inland lakes, especially in the Oakland County and greater West Bloomfield area develop, more and more homes are built with bigger and bigger footprints, bigger roofs, bigger driveways, and bigger lawns. And what these are is impervious surfaces so that water with pollutants flow very quickly, flows very quickly down into the uh, lakes without any impediment. The same is true for E. coli. For example, if your dog goes out in the backyard and you don't clean up after it, a rainstorm can wash all of that down into the lake, providing phosphorus, nitrogen, and most importantly, E. coli. Um, Fred and Doug, um, how have your lakes changed over the years? You've lived on them longer than I have lived on this local lake. How have your lakes changed in terms of the properties and the impervious surfaces? Well, um, back in 1978 is when my family moved to uh, the lake we now live on. And it was one of the, you know, the best lakes, had a great reputation as being a very healthy lake. It was the first in a, the series of lakes leading to the Huron River chain. Um, it was spring fed, is spring fed, um, and just a wonderful lake. Um, and when we first moved on, a, a third of the lake was undeveloped. And as you were, you know, discussing the the amount of building that's gone on around our lakes around in the metropolitan area is tremendous, um, and of course that does have an impact on the ecology of the lake. And so what has happened um, for myself was back in 2012, 
2013, I began to realize that the shoreline was really becoming densely filled with, with these you know, weeds, and I didn't know much about aquatic plants. Um, and so I contacted, uh, first of all, a couple neighbors who shared my concern, and we contacted um, Michigan State University, a uh, professor by the name of Dr. Joe Latimer, who's an aquatic ecologist. She put us in touch with Lisa Huberty, who's the aquatics nuisance uh, weed specialist for the DEQ. And we went up there, we put weeds directly on their table, and she went through both of them and told us, you know, that we really had a problem, that this was that Eurasian water milfoil, of which we didn't know, you know, anything about it. So we tried to educate ourselves as best as possible. And let me stop you there because I'm going to have you speak about that more um, in a little bit. Uh, Fred, tell us about uh, on your lake what's going on in terms of the density. Well, uh, the density has changed, as, as you both mentioned, for uh, the, the whole area. Uh, bigger roofs, bigger driveways, more homes, uh, more runoff. Um, some roads have been widened. It's increased runoff. Uh, also, the uh, proliferation of the zebra mussels, which goes back about 20 years. My experience is about 30 years back with the area lakes. And uh, when the zebra mussels proliferated, uh, the water cleared and the weed growth accelerated tremendously. Um, all types of weeds. And so we've been, um, we've been harvesting for the 30 years plus that I've been exposed to uh, our lake. And um, it's uh, becoming more and more of a problem. About uh, three years ago, we had a, a huge issue in one, one part of the lake in a bay where um, in early in the year, I think it was 2012, that was such a uh, mild winter and a very warm spring. And uh, the, we had to do some emergency harvesting in there just to keep the bay open so that people could uh, navigate with their boats. And I mean, it's, it's bad for swimming, it's bad for fishing, it's bad for boating, it's, it's a tremendous problem. And so we're, uh, that's, uh, it's, it's changed greatly, I guess, to, to answer your question in the last 30 years. It was pristine, as Doug mentioned, uh, when I first started uh, uh, on the lake, and uh, now we have the beginnings of some very serious problems, and we think we're on top of them. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about the recreational use of the lakes, uh, because uh, certainly that, in my working with you, has been a, a part of your supervision of the lake. Um, what's come up, and you made a good point, uh, you talked about the fact that it was weeds, and they were proliferating uh, quite uh, excessively. Uh, but I wanted to also at this point explain the concepts of the differences in the weeds. Um, some of the stuff is native Michigan. Others are invasives, both plant and animal. I think people are, are quite knowledgeable in the state of Michigan because they've heard over the years of the zebra mussels, how they've clogged up drainage systems, how they've affected uh, systems down river area uh, in the Rouge River system. Uh, but what's interesting is, and I thought um, I would share this with our viewers now, is the concept of how invasives get into the lake, uh, all the various lakes. First of all, we have on our lake a uh, Department of Natural Resources launch site. So boats come in, and boats are supposed to be washed before they come into a lake. And I'm not really sure that that's a reliable thing that's happening in our various lakes. Private lakes can bring in boats without much supervision, so that's one way to bring in invasives. In the big picture, that's the way that the Great Lakes have become infested with certain invasives. Uh, they've actually come in from Europe. Uh, as Doug was saying, it's Eurasian milfoil. And these things come in through the bigger boats and their ballast tanks, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the other thing that's interesting that I wanted to mention is people say, well, I don't have a lot of boats in my lake or I have a pond. How did these things get in there? And what people don't realize is that the birds and the amphibians really spread these things around. Um, the birds, uh, through their cycle of eating and doing what they do, uh, can fly around and spread these uh, seeds from invasive plants that they eat. And the frogs tend to uh, have them stick to their feet and they kind of hop around, frogs and toads, and uh, spread them to various lakes. Um, 
Fred, you mentioned the zebra mussels and the water clarity, and I thought I would, re I thought I would explain that as well. The zebra mussels have created a vicious cycle. They, they take in various nutrients, which include plankton and very small animals and small plant, unicellular, one cell plant species. And in doing so, these are the particles in the lakes that uh, decrease the clarity. Uh, in other words, you can't see too far down. The zebra mussels have made lakes very, very clear, and any depth that can receive sunlight can start growing weeds. Now, I know I lived on one lake where we actually saw milfoil growing from uh, 25 feet down. How has the clarity been on your lake, Doug? Um, the clarity, again, you know, has been, has been excellent. Um, which we thought initially showed the, the health of the lake. And then, of course, zebra mussels was one of the reasons the clarification grew even more great than what it had been previously. Um, so, I, and I've read, too, that the, that the EWM, Eurasian water milfoil, can grow actually as, as high as like 25, like you said, or 30 feet. Also, in your long experience on our lake, you've seen the same thing in terms of the clarity? The clarity seems to, it increased tremendously when the, um, the zebra mussels really proliferated. They seem to have maybe stabilized, but the clarity remains very, very, very uh, clear and, and you know you can see 10 15 feet down sometimes when the boat when the lakes are not stirred up by boat activity just in terms of that clarity Leon uh, we did a secchi disc reading because we do monitor the transparency of the lake as part of the cooperative lake management program and we had a reading of 32 feet which is unheard which is of in <laughs> the old days before zebra mussels if you got a reading of 12 feet it was considered very good secchi discs are round disks that have alternating, they look like a cut up pie and they have alternating white and black. And you lower them down on a tape measure until you get that reading. Uh, and that's the reading of water clarity. And they even, you know, I think it's appropriate to say you never have uh, children do the reading because they say that their vision is so good that they, <laughs> they see it farther down. But in any case, that's an interesting thing that, that you both had said and are agreeing with that at first it was uh, bragging rights that you had this wonderful clarity Absolutely. and it turned out to be a curse. Absolutely. People seem to think that clear water is clean water in a healthy lake and that's not necessarily the case. Now, Fred, Fred does on our lake um, really helps us take good care of the lake and also keeps a very close eye on it because he's in charge of the uh, sheriff's patrol. Um, I really wanted you to speak today about, you know, the concepts of what we're seeing in terms of new boats and wh what they're doing to the uh, plant the plant life, both native and invasive, because I think it's important. Doug's going to get into that, and he'll explain that later. But you know, tell us a bit about the recreation and what's going on on lakes. Well, the trend in our inland lakes is bigger, 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 larger boats, larger personal watercraft. Um, I've seen 26-foot boats trailered in on our lake. Uh, the new trend in um, water uh, sports is uh, wakeboarding and wake surfing. And those boats are some 25 feet long. They uh, add, they have water tanks to add weight so that the boat sinks down, <clears throat> all of which increases the disruption on the bottom in the shallower areas. And you know, uh, watercraft are not supposed to operate at any uh, above slow no wake speed in waters less than three feet deep, but that's very hard to enforce and most people ignore it. And so we just have more and more stimulation of that, of those weed beds, uh, which with, um, I guess it's the Eurasian milfoil specifically, it's uh, very quickly spread when it's uh, disturbed and chopped up and spread around. I've seen um, areas in our lake that um, 10 years ago didn't have any such weeds, and now there are more and more each year. Well, interesting. It's frightening. Interestingly enough, um, we'll go to a couple other quick topics, and then uh, Doug will talk more about the milfoil. You're you're 100 percent correct in what you said. Uh, for some lakes, it really is frightening, and what it's done to the recreation. Um, there are fishing effects because of the density of certain invasives. One of them is the milfoil, 
And the other is an algae called starry stonewort. Uh, I've talked to the DNR and they're very concerned because it seems to be spreading on lakes and it's, it's actually an abrasive algae that disrupts long-standing uh, uh, fish breeding grounds, which obviously isn't good for a lake. Also, I don't think we'll spend a lot of time on what happens to uh, public beaches and swimming. I think everybody's had that experience where they've been told not to come to a particular state park because the E. coli count was so high that it wasn't safe. Uh, this is just common sense. Uh, I don't think we need to discuss further where the E. coli <laughs> comes from, and uh, it would just be better if it weren't in the water or certainly at a lower count. Specifically, I wanted Doug, who has had great experience in this regard, to tell us more about the milfoil and some of the science surrounding it. After that visit to Lansing, um, we then decided to take our own samples from the lake. And so we took nine samples and sent them off to Grand Valley State University where a Dr. Ryan Thume does DNA analysis. And of the nine samples, he, two he could not read. They, you know, the seven though, they were all um, Eurasian water milfoil and four of the seven were hybridized. So they've actually you know, been able with the DNA mapping to determine that these are hybrids. And of course this will cause concern about how to treat them and, and how they might become resistant to certain chemical treatments and so forth. Um, the, the thing that I learned then about the Eurasian water milfoil is that it's, it's now the most widespread submerged aquatic weed in the northern half of the United States as well as I know that it's now up in Canada, British Columbia, and so forth. So it's, it's really a problem that has spread across our country and is working its way north. Um, and it spreads by uh, stem fragments. So one of the things is, you know, talking about the boat traffic and so forth, definitely agitation. those propellers, the agitation, is increasing the, the fragmentation. And the plant naturally spreads through fragmentation. And of course, this exacerbates it. Um, the, uh, the, it's rooted in the sediment. Um, it can grow, it does grow completely underwater. Uh, as we said, it can go f anywhere from one to as high as 30 feet. Um, it has these leaves uh, that, that are feather-like whorls um, and they're, for Eurasian water milfoil, they are in, a, in a, uh, a whorl of four at the node of the stem and they spread out. And if you count those, you can get 14 to 24 pairs of these little leaflets. And that's the Eurasian water milfoil or a hybrid. The northern milfoil, which is native to this state, um, is not a problem. And it has from five to 10 leaflet pairs. And yet they look you know, almost identical. You really have to count those pairs to see what you have. Um, and then you know, the problems we've mentioned you know, in, in terms of both uh, natural biological concerns, in terms of water quality, in terms of fish, in terms of birds, in terms of wildlife, uh, those are very real in terms of the negative impact that this, this noxious weed is having, um, as well as recreational you know, purposes. Um, and of course, we've you know, discovered that prevention you know, is the best policy, and I, and I, I think, uh, Leon, you're going to speak or maybe you have or will, to the, uh, to the uh, use of uh, fertilizers and so forth, how important, yes. how important that is. So in any event, we, you know, the, the question then uh, becomes uh, how to treat that. Uh, before we take a commercial break, you had a reference for us that you wanted to mention. Yes, um, this right here is a, is a text that's available free of charge uh, from the DEQ. Uh, to any resident in the state of Michigan. And it's over 200 pages of kind of best practices. And it's, you know, the biology and control of aquatic plants, a best management practices handbook. And so again, I, I, I think, you know, we all agree that, you know, prevention comes about through education. So we, we urge anyone who might be watching this program to really become educated, you know, become involved. Doug and Fred, thank you. And now let's take a break, and we'll be right back. You're watching Civic Center TV, television that's close to home. Hi, 
I'm Leon Padell, and I have lived on and cared for waterways in the greater West Bloomfield and Oakland County area for 30 years. From a small inland lake with weeds covering the surface to a toxic algae bloom in Lake Erie, it all comes from pollution of our waters. So what can we do to slow down or prevent this process? First, we can fertilize with phosphorus-free products on our lawn. Do not fertilize too often and don't fertilize too close to streams, lakes, and waterways. Never fertilize on frozen ground. Clean up after your dog so the E. coli doesn't run down into the waterways. And you can even learn to plant beautiful rain gardens at shorelines to filter the runoff before it gets into the water. Stay in touch with your community by watching Civic Center TV, television that's close to home. Welcome back to Lake Views, Doug and Fred. Uh, let's continue. Um, I'll start with Doug. How are you dealing with the milfoil overgrowth? Well, historically our lake for over 30 years used harvesting as the sole means to control the, the weed growth that was occurring in our lake. Um, and then after this visit to East Lansing and realizing that we had this invasive and reading that fragmentation you know, increases the problem, we were then concerned about the mechanical harvesting. Um, and yet there are advantages to that. You can remove biomass. And we, so consequently, you know, we're using, I guess you would say like a bimodal approach. Correct. We use both um, the uh, chemical treatment initially, and then we come back with mechanical harvesting later in the summer to remove some of that biomass. And I think last year we removed like 186,000 pounds of, of, you know, weeds from the lake. And of course that all represents nutrient, you know, value to the lake, so it, it helps. Um, so the advantages are that you're removing nutrients. Um, 90%, 95% of that biomass of aquatic plants is water. So when you take out five tons of this Eurasian water milfoil, supposedly, I guess, you only have 500 pounds of actual dry matter. Um, the disadvantages to the, you know, to the harvesting, obviously it's not selective. Um, you're harvesting, you know, Every, everything out there, wherever the harvester goes. And also that floating fragments, the fragmentation can be a concern. So you do wanna make sure that, you know, that you're working with a harvesting company that is you know, fairly re responsible in terms of gathering up those fragments, because that, that can create a problem. Another thing that we looked into was biological control. And there's a weevil um, developed or not developed, I mean it's native, it's a native uh, species, but it feeds upon the EWM. I mean it likes it. Problem is it doesn't winter over very well. Fish eat these weevils and it becomes very expensive to try to keep restocking them. And all of the studies apparently have been inconclusive. So where there's hope that there would be a biological control, it right now doesn't seem to be, you know, on the horizon. Um, which then brings us to aquatic herbicides, chemicals. And I was very hesitant, you know, to, to go down that path. And I think like many people, we can think back to Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring, you know, where, wherein we were, you know, poisoning our waters indiscriminately, so to speak. And it was really that book in 1962 that led to the creation of the EPA. And it's through the EPA that I actually be, you know, feel comfortable in terms of introducing chemicals in a very selective way to go after this invasive product. Um, the EPA requires between 84 and 124 different studies for each product 
that's going to be introduced into the environment. Um, and then the other thing is the, the number of uh, you know, chemicals that can be approved, a very small portion of those are actually aquatic approved. Um, and so they're very, very protective, very selective in terms of what chemicals are approved. The other thing is that in the state of Michigan, like other states, you can go beyond the EPA requirements in terms of safety. Um, and the state of Michigan does that. Uh, apparently, you know, they, they put in more restrictions, in other words, in terms of the swimming or in terms of watering your, your lawns or flowers. Um, Michigan is actually, you know, even more protective than the EPA. Um, the application methods um, in terms of the, the chemicals, you have emergent plants which are, you know, emerging from the water and then you can have these foliar herbicides that can actually be, you know, sprayed right on the foliage. With the EWM, that's a, a submersed aquatic plant, and you can go two different ways. One would be contact, and then the other one is systemic. And with the contact, you again, um, you're using, using a fairly high concentration. You're spraying it on the surface of the water. It descends onto the plant itself, and then is absorbed into it. It has a, a short half-life. Um, swimming, you can typically not have to wait more than a, than a day at, at maximum. Um, and then watering maybe three days to seven days. So it's, it's, it's less, um, I guess, toxic in terms of you know, actual use that way. But it's also maybe sometimes not as effective. Uh, systemic herbicides, on the other hand, um, you have to wait longer times, but then they seem to be more effective in terms of knocking down this EWM and so forth. Um, and there are watering restri restrictions sometimes as long as three weeks and so forth. So it it's really becomes a decision for a lake to make in terms of you know, what way to go, when these chemicals are introduced and so forth. And that's why, again, I think education is key. And to also work with somebody that, uh, that you respect. And so we actually on our lake have hired a consultant who has over 30 years in the business. Uh, the applicator for the chemicals, again, has over 30 years in the business. And I think it's the integrity of the individuals that you're working with that really, you know, is, it, is something that you want to feel comfortable with. Um, so in any event, the, there are like 300 herbicides, only 14 can be used in aquatic systems. Um, the contact herbicides, again, work quickly. The systemic, uh, you know, take longer time. And then there is, you know, dissipation in terms of the fact that these are mixed with water or else they're in, in a pellet form. Um, and so that there can be, you know, dispersion, you know, throughout the water. Um, the degradation can be affected by temperature, sunlight, pH, and then apparently the herbicide can bind with certain ions and can make it uh, maybe less effective. And then the other thing is mon monitoring. And it's, of course, you, something you want to do is continually, you know, to monitor. I have an actual form here um, that is actually a posting in terms of, first of all, you have to have permission from the property owners in terms of treating their area. Um, in Michigan, property owners can own, riper can own the lake bottom, but you don't own the water. Um, so you have to have permission of whoever owns the lake bottom and or that, that shoreline. And then these notices go up. And the notice actually states very specifically what the restrictions are and how long you have to wait in terms of you know, watering a garden or in terms of bathing um, and so forth. And, it, and so this is something that, again, the, the Department of Environmental Quality monitors very carefully. Uh, to make, ensure that these products are being used the way they've been designed to be used. And these products can't be used without a permit from the state DNR. Uh, Fred, tell us about the experience on our lake and uh, the tonnage that we've had the last two seasons. Well, we've been uh, harvesting also for over 30 years and uh, the last couple of years, I guess last year was uh, uh, a record, 500 tons uh, was harvested uh, uh, last year and uh, was needed. Uh, the year, let's see, 2012, the year I was referring to previously, we actually had to do two harvests, that emergency harvest in, uh, in a bay, and then the regular harvesting, which usually happens late in July. So um, it's, there's more and more weeds, and um, if we had more budget and more, more time to, to harvest, we would. 
Um, but we're doing the best we can, and uh, so far we're uh, staying ahead of the curve, or so it seems at this point. But it's, you know, we monitor it um, all the time, especially in the summer when it's nice. Well, I'm going to make a few comments, and you two can add on uh, at the end as you wish. Uh, I wanted to go over some concepts uh, I'm sure everybody wants to know besides uh, herbicides and uh, harvesting. What are some of the ways that we can deal with these things in terms of prevention? Well, first and foremost, we're seeing some other invasives. Um, there's a new one that is uh, felt to be a real threat. It's called hydrilla. And the good news is, is that we both had surveys and we don't have any of it. There is uh, starry stonewort, which is the algae that I mentioned before. And I've been told, although I can't verify this, that that seems to be stabilizing rather than uh, spreading. So that's good news. But we have to realize what the three of us have been talking about for this whole time is what's happening to these lakes and how it then affects our fresh water system. All these inland lakes and waterways eventually wind up into the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes, of course, are, are the world's largest repository of fresh water. And the Great Lakes have suffered tremendously from the practices of homeowners, farms, golf courses, and general pollution problems. And I wanted to stress the importance, the importance of the show Lake Views is for people to realize what the end result can be. In the summer of 2014, the Toledo Water Treatment Plant in Lake Erie that services the Toledo area as well as southern Michigan completely shut down for a number of days because of a toxic algae bloom. Now we've been talking about zebra mussels and how they adapt to the environment and clear the lake up. The other thing zebra mussels do is they kill the local uh, population of clams. They have a sense of the toxicity of these micronutrients. And when you have zebra mussels, you can actually get a flare of a toxic algae because the zebra mussels are not eating that. They're eating something else that's more tolerable. So these are the results in the Great Lakes. And we owe, uh, we owe as a Great Lakes state, uh, this debt in terms of taking care of our inland waterways. And it's not just lakefront owners, it's everybody in the state. So basically, we've talked about what we're doing in the lakes themselves. But let me talk a little bit about what we all need to be doing. The main thing that's causing a problem in these lakes are the impervious surfaces and the nutrient runoff, particularly with our fertilization concepts. Now, the city of Orchard Lake Village has a new ordinance for fertilization. And one of the most important aspects of that is adding in that there must be a certain percentage of slow release nitrogen. So very careful research has shown that for homeowners, if one of their fertilization services is spraying on liquid fertilizer, it cannot be slow release. Slow release nitrogen is only in, contained in, in uh, uh, fertilizers that are granular. So you need to have granular fertilizers. They can't be put too close to the lake. They should never be put on frozen ground. And also, you, sh you don't really need to be fertilizing that often. Lake owners particularly often water off the lake. They draw their water off the lake. And believe me, there's more than enough phosphorus and nitrogen in the lake. The state has banned phosphorus fertilizers. However, this applies to homeowners and doesn't apply to farms and to golf courses. Um, the other thing that we found really helps, other than the obvious things, you clean up after your dog so it doesn't wash in to the lakes and waterways. The other thing that we are stressing now is we have an environmental uh, uh, person comes in and consults on any redoing of backyards and, and shorelines. And there's some very nice uh, pictures and literature on the internet about rain gardens which are filters at shorelines to waterways, and streams, lakes, et cetera, uh, filters to keep the nutrients from going into the water itself. Unfortunately, these ordinances are tough to enforce, and we really do have to be vigilant. 
Um, as we come to an end of our show, uh, any comments from either of you? All of us um, living in Michigan uh, become, take on the responsibility of becoming like stewards of our water systems. Um, and as you say, we can do that through, you know, using the proper fertilizers and also, you know, keeping ourselves aware of the latest uh, developments in terms of what does pose threats to our, to our water systems. Um, and consequently, education, I think, is absolutely key. Um, and we're doing this not just for ourselves and not just for this moment, but for, for future generations. And so I would just urge anyone who has an interest to really become more knowledgeable and become involved. Our lakes are the assets that cause people to spend the money that they do to live in the area. And, and protecting these lakes uh, is of utmost importance. Uh, if they get out of hand, if the weeds get out of hand, uh, it becomes very expensive and very time consuming to try to turn one around. So, you know, adhering to the fertilizer ordinance and, and picking up after your dog, all of these things are important. Um, it, will, it could impact us uh, in terms of property values. If a lake starts to go bad, uh, lakes gain a reputation. And so our reputation of our lakes is good. We want to keep it that way. And so um, it's very important and it cannot be overemphasized. Thank you both. I would like to thank Doug and Fred for joining us today. And I hope you have enjoyed our show, Lake Views. We hope that you'll use this information in planning your own environmentally friendly home projects. For more information, visit civiccentertv.com slash lakeviews. We'll see you next time.